For a long time, I forgot about this. It was so painful. Mm. I didn't want to think about it. Just blocked it Just out. Blocked it out so much. Yeah. And with all the events that's happening recently, and all this discrimination, things those emotions are surfacing, and the words begin to make more sense. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel. So glad you joined us for this episode of Our Voices Matter podcast. May 1st kicks off Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As you know, the AAPI community has been under attack recently because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I have an extraordinary conversation today with a member of the AAPI community. She is herself an immigrant, and she has a remarkable story to share about growing up as an immigrant child in this country and going on to achieve great success with her company. Her company is called Bay Rep, and she has combined her love of building homes, she is an architect by profession, with her love for humanity. And I love the way she has connected the dots here to show up as all of who she is. I do hope you will enjoy this conversation. I think you will take away quite a bit from it and that you'll be as inspired as I am. So enjoy. Grace Mace, it is such a pleasure to have you on our Voices Matter podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, great. Me too. So um, tell our audience a little bit about Bay Rep, about what your company does. And and then I want to ask you about the name because there's a fabulous backstory to the name of the company. But first, tell us what you do. So Bay Rep is all about helping homeowners and professionals, whether it's an architect, designers, contractors, to collaborate more effectively together and focus more on the connection about human to human, how to support each other. And a, when we think about renovating a home or building a new home, everyone on the team have the same goals about elevating life. But yet we all have different experiences, different perspective. And the experience in some ways are very similar to there, there's tons of frustrations and it's emotional roller coasters. And it happens on both sides. It's just mm-hmm. coming from different lens. And sometimes what we realize is if we can have different recalibrate our expectations, then we have better way to collaborate together. And so what Bay Rep is all about, connecting the right people working together, provide a framework for them to collaborate more effectively, and also safeguard their investments by means of their financials to ensure that the project's done right and on time. Okay. All right. So the name Bay Rep. Tell us how that came about. What is the, what is the Bay part and what's the rep part? Awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very personal to me. Um, Bay is really derived from when I worked as a volunteer in a small town called Fusana in Tunisia. Uh, we were building the school and the local had never seen an Asian person their entire life. So a bunch of little kids would you know, snoop around while I'm doing construction out in the middle of the day. <laughs> And they couldn't really figure out how to pronounce my name. I was using my Chinese name at that time when I traveled. And so they just point my point at me and call me Bay. And later I found out for a local um, elderly, he explained to me that Bay means someone is coming to good, do good deeds without an agenda. And that's exactly that's what's doing. I was really interested to learn about the culture, but at the same time, be able to contribute by helping them to build their school. And for me, I just, I just love construction. <laughs> so oh. it's the best of both worlds. That must and have made you feel so good when you heard what that name meant. Absolutely. It really, it was just very special to me to know that this is, they recognize what I was doing is for, for, to, to be there to support them, helping them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, I worked at Berkeley as a campus architect, effectively owner's rep. And my job is all about connecting the right people together and for them to, for all of us to collaborate together to have a common goal and to focus on executing on that common goal. And at the same time, continue to be respectful with each other and to do the best we can and cheering everyone on to, so we can ultimately deliver the experience for a client. So awesome. that's where the rep came about. So be, okay. Be to I, call Bay Rep. I love it. I absolutely love this. Okay, so let's go a little bit into your backstory. You mentioned that you went to Berkeley undergrad. I will not hold that against you because <laughs> I went to Stanford. Okay, 
So, you know, we used to fight over the axe all we the did. time. Every day. Okay. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun. This uh, yeah, I respect, a lot of fun. <laughs> I respect a lot of people. A lot of folks <laughs> in my life are Stanford grads. So I, I respect yeah. all of you. Likewise, likewise. So um, before you got to Berkeley, so give us a little bit of your backstory. Where did you grow up? What's, what's your story? So I grew up in Taiwan, I was born in Taiwan and lived there till I was 11. And my parents have this idea about immigrating to America because it's America, right? American dream and so forth. And we moved here and I didn't speak more of English. I was the only child in this school, didn't know how to speak English. And I had to learn really quickly. And I will, every day I'll bring my Chinese English dictionary to school Although kids didn't recognize how different I was to them. They see me as this foreign kid and didn't belong there. And truthfully, I also didn't know how I was feeling either. One is I didn't have a vocabulary, nor do I have, have I experiences because back in Taiwan, I have the same color hair as everyone else. I have the same features as many people. So I never feel different that way. Mm-hmm. And coming to America it was the first time it was a culture shock. And although it's a fascinating, it's exciting going to Disneyland and all sort of things, yeah. but there's always the, <clears throat> I didn't feel I belonged there and kids would make fun of me. Um, I remember going to school, the bus on the bus, the kids would not move inch for me to sit down and I would be walk all the way towards the end of the bus. And unfortunately I would just stand there for quite some time till the bus driver started <laughs> making announcement as you know, I'm not going to drive till someone let her sit down. Of course, someone congratulated you, let me sit a little bit of it, the seat and we're able to move forward. Mm-hmm. I also had experience where the kids in the back would chew up the paper and spit into my hair. And so I, it was such a foreign experience and I didn't know how, how I was supposed to feel. Yeah. It was tough. Or, or why it was happening. Why would, exactly what yeah. was happening? Why I just was it know happening? I'm just they being were mean, mean yeah. to me. They were being mean to me. I didn't even have the language to kind of label what that is, let alone to process that experience. And I was fortunate to have an amazing teacher. She saw a different side of me. She recognized that I was doing math and I continued to excel math. And she would just give me new textbook practically every other week. And I'll just go through the textbook and able to figure it out, mainly because I recognize patterns. Numbers are easy for me to figure out if, all right, here, based on the pattern, I can understand, you know, reverse engineer the logic, why things are happening that way. Mm -hmm. And soon enough, she arranged with a principal to monitor me. And the principal came in the classroom and saw me, I was able to go through the textbook without any problem. And next thing I knew is I was taking the school bus with the principal to the high school. I wasn't too sure what was about. I still didn't understand why I was there. And, and what I, grade were you in at this point? I was just sixth grade. I was sixth a little grade. kid, 11 year old kid. Grade. Okay. And then now they're taking you to high school because that's how, how advanced you were in terms of your math capability. Evidently. And so yeah, yeah. I remember the principal walked me to the office and they exchanged a few words. And then next thing I was taken to a classroom and you can just, as soon as walked in all his turn and they looked at me, I looked at them in fear. Yeah. <laughs> so what did what I do? am I doing here? Yeah. And they showed me my C. I sound down. I got a new textbook. And the next thing I see the numbers on the board. I was like, okay, that was calming. I can understand this. I can handle this. Yeah. Right. And so it was exciting because I was learning something new. And then um, after the class, I went back to the office, the principal and I went back on the bus. And by the time I got to this, our elementary school, it was, I think it was the end of recess too. And all the kids saw me walking out of the bus with the principal and I was holding a new textbook. And that changed uh, the dynamic, I would imagine. Absolutely. It changed mm-hmm. the whole way of how people saw me. I was no longer the stupid kid and didn't speak a word of English. I actually had something to offer. And so that's when I realized knowledge or education is so important for all of us to mm-hmm. be able to mm-hmm. arm ourselves to move on to the next level and to cross that threshold what I did, didn't know how to get to. How did you deal with that whole time in your life emotionally? Um, because that had to be just devastating. How did you, how did you get through it? I mean, aside from the story that you just shared with us, um, how did you deal with the emotions of it? 
Wow. It was hard. It took me a long time to process this. And one is for a long time, I forgot about this. It was so painful. Mm. I didn't want to think about it. Just blocked it, it out. Blocked out so much. Yeah. And with all the events that's happening recently and all this discrimination, things, those emotions are surfacing and the words begin to make more sense for me to begin to process. And at that time, I actually thought about committing suicide twice. No, did you really? I did. As an 11 year old kid, I didn't know how to process it. You just feel like I was not wanted and I was not, I didn't belong anywhere. Did you talk to your parents about it? My father was in Taiwan. My mother was busy working. She had two jobs. I knew how hard she was working. And so I wrote a letter, long letter to my father. And during that time, soon after I sent it till the moment he received it, I actually attempted twice. Um, I even remember sitting in in the bathroom and putting my arm over the toilet just so I didn't want to make a mess. So my parents didn't have to worry about that. But I'm my, fortunately, my father got the letter um, and he tried to explain to me what it meant to him, how, what I'm, I was meant to him. How much and he loved you. How much he loved me. And he helped me to rethink about the world, not from my own pain, but think about outside of my space. Mm-hmm. Think about all things that I could have done. And that was around the time when the teacher recognized my ability in math. And that's what helped me to pull me out of that. Right. And I think sometimes we just need to reckon and stop and recognize someone's strength and bring them along and maybe encourage them. them. They may be the lowest point in their life, but reach out and pull them out of it. They may not realize how to even get out. And I was at the moment, 11 years old, I didn't know what to think. And all I know was I was confused. I was in pain. Oh, my goodness. Um, You mentioned what's going on in the world today and um, the anti-Asian hate that has come about as a result of the coronavirus. How have you, you just said that this whole thing has triggered what happened to you as a child. So how are you processing all of this now? What what are your thoughts? And, And actually, as we are Um, recording this interview now, the Senate in the last 24 hours has passed the anti-Asian hate bill uh, in a bipartisan manner, which is nice to hear. So we'll see what happens next in the House and how this is going to uh, hopefully have a really positive effect and change some of these dynamics. But um, how are you, what are you thinking and feeling right now in this moment? I'm so excited. And even just the verdict a few days ago. I think this is a good direction of how the country should be thinking about. The Derek Chauvin verdict is what yes. we're talking about. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And this is how, and thanks to you for that day, I really needed uh, and for, for us to so, begin to have that conversation and yeah. for us to process, to process them together. We all mm-hmm. are feeling that this at different emotional level and right. we need to, to have, surround ourselves with the support to move forward together. And the conversation that that you're referring to, just so we can let our audience know, is a conversation that you and I had in a room with maybe a couple hundred people on Clubhouse the night of the verdict. And I invited Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee to join us. And we had a really, um, I think, wonderful discussion about the verdict and what it means, but most important, what we can do now going forward. And... um, I'm, I'm so glad that you were part of that, that conversation. Um, so tell me, as you are processing now, um, you know, this bill hopefully will, will make a difference, but there's still so much that we need to do on a one-to-one, human-to-human level yes. to help each other understand. So what is it that you want to say, if you could talk to someone who... Um, is one of these people who has lashed out at a member of the Asian American community and has just tried to blame the community for the coronavirus and just has espoused hate. What would you say to that person? First of all, I would acknowledge that, you know, 
we're both human. And there are certain things that we don't have control over. But what we have control over is start showing compassion with each other and just recognize that we're in this together, lighter, like it or not. And we all, we, there are some common grounds. And it's time for us to sit down and be civil with each other and having those common discussions. Focus on what are things that we're similar versus what things that we're different. And I, I think about my experience one time, um, my family and I drove out to, we were in Atlanta visiting our relatives and I was working at the same time. And my son went to, was going to um, space camp in Huntsville. And early in the morning, we drove from Atlanta to Huntsville and we stopped by Waffle House to get our breakfast. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much middle of nowhere. Um, I, well, at least for me, I didn't know the distance. Yeah. And, and so I've, I've it was born to me. Exact, I know exactly where you're talking about. I have right. been, I've been to space camp there. So. Right. And I didn't know all the cities and along the way, but we did see a, a Waffle House mm -hmm. along the, the road. And so we stopped by. And my family, four of us, we walked in the room, walk into the uh, Waffle House, and you can just feel the tension. All eyes turn on us. Mm. And they looked at me, looked at my husband, looked at my two kids, looked back at me, looked at my kids, looked at my husband, back to me. It was clear. We didn't belong there. And we're not locals. We weren't trying to blend in or anything. Is um, your husband also Asian? No, my husband's Caucasian. Um, Caucasian, okay. And so, so they were trying to make the, like, why are you with her? Why are you with her? Exactly. Right. It wasn't okay. so much of why are you with him? <laughs> yeah, why are you with her? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and how can you have this two byproducts? <laughs> and so we placed our order. My husband took the kids to the restaurant to wash their hands. And the prefer of my eye, I saw a group of service folks. There's one female and two, I believe two African-American gentlemen, they were eating. And I just leaned over to the uh, uh, waitress and I asked her if you could, if you don't mind, just put the bill on my, and I'll be happy to pay for it. These are to members make, of the arm of the, of the military. Yes. Military and, okay. and for me is they're, they're out there sacrificing. This is the least I could do. And I didn't think much of it, but, but didn't think much of it. And I, you know, hand her my credit card, she processed it and I hand it back and I proceed to look at my phone because it's still working. And next thing, like a minute or so, they came to me, they walked towards me. I guess they found out I ended up paying for their breakfast. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing anything. I don't think it was extravagant. And they thanked me and I said, no, please. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. So we could be here have the freedom. And I think that's a moment I start connecting with the other people, other patrons in the room. Mm. They now saw me have the same appreciation, even though my gesture may be different, but we all appreciate them. That was our common ground. And I think that changed their perspective of who I am versus someone coming into their space. Mm. I'm not there to, to, to stay for long, but I do share same common interests of appreciating these folks that are serving this country and sacrifice themselves for us, our freedom. So I think That's all scary. of us need to be recognized that everything we do, whether at home, at work, at a restaurant, at a job site, whatever you are, make a conscious effort to find the common ground. When we do, we can connect each other. And we can begin to learn to develop trust. That's, and that's where it has to start. We learn to develop trust and recognize that we, you know, we all want the same things and just human to human. That's, that's what counts. How, how are you handling? So you have one child um, at home. And then one child in college, right? Correct. So what, what are the conversations that you're having with your family in the current political, social climate? We're very open. Um, we want our kids to understand this is the environment we live in. Rather than be complaining about issues, but we want to talk about why people are behaving this way, why people are thinking this way. 
And if you understand, just like any, any type of negotiation, if you understand where they're coming from Mm -hmm. and also what matters to them, what's important to them. Yeah. Then you can have better conversation by engaging with them at their point and walk through the discussion and share your perspective, not to impose your perspective and have a much more um, honest conversation to exchange ideas. Yes. And Listen we may have to what diff- the other person has to say. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And to even to know that if by means you need to step back or make some sacrifices for the greater goods, you should be thinking about doing so. And actually, it's interesting. We, I had son, when my son was applying for college last year, and he was questioning about all his affirmative actions. At some point, you got, we, we had this discussion and, and his perspective from where he's coming from is, I want that position. I want to be getting into that school. For me, as a parent, looking at holistically, no matter what school you get in, you'll get a great education. But what if you have the opportunity to bring someone along and learn with them? Yeah. That they're less likely to get in because of their color of their skin, because of their economic uh, situation. What if they have a seat at the table? What more information can you learn from them? Your education will be so much rich because of them. Not just from classroom, right. but because they are there and help you to gain additional perspective you otherwise wouldn't get to. So much of what you're, you're talking about, um, and I know this is important to you because we've talked about it a little bit offline, is just emotional intelligence. Yes. Just understanding how to communicate. And, um, you know, the, the story that you told about um, buying breakfast for the service members, you know, that was an act of emotional intelligence, at least in my book, it is. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are your thoughts about that general subject matter in, in terms of how we should incorporate that into, into our daily lives? Now, our daily life, simply when we talk about emotional intelligence, really is not that complicated. I know it's being academically labeled a certain way, and there may be multiple steps, but it really comes down to us and we're looking, what can we do? And how it, will my action and my words will impact others? Start with that moment, start with yourself. Don't point a finger as they didn't do this. They owe me this, they mistreated me, they wronged me this. That's all easy to say, but what if we change the, comp- the comp- composition by means of looking on myself, what can I do differently? So I can have a better outcome, not just for myself, but for everyone around me, the benefit of everyone. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be better? It would be. It, it would be so much better. But how, how would you deal with it? I mean, you know, we've seen all these horrific um, images of, of Asian Americans, you know, being assaulted. And um, how, how do you respond to something like that? I mean, if that were to happen to you, what do you think you would do? If that were to happen to me, one is... I will find a way to protect myself. But more importantly, I will step back and let them understand. I understand your pain. Can we talk about this? Ask permission. Mm -hmm. Can we have a conversation? Mm -hmm. And they may want to not, not want to engage with me, but I want them to know that I'm interested to understand. I'm interested to learn. I'm curious. I'm not here to blame. Something that must have happened. They have their story. And this is the reason why they're behaving this way. I'm not projecting my view onto them. But let's yeah. help me to understand. Let's figure out. Let's bridge that gap. Well, you know, I, you know the, the silver lining in all of this chaos and angst that we're living in right now is that we are finally starting to have really deeply meaningful conversations about this, about subject matter that um, that is so fundamentally important to how we live our lives. So right. talking about, about race and bias and gender and, um, and hate, you know, talking, really talking about the impact of it and how we can combat it with a level of emotional intelligence that allows us, as you said, to first look inward and then to make that human connection. Right. Um, it, it's just, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, I'm not trivializing what happened to many people, victims. Of and course. The, the, they, I mean, they couldn't prepare for it. 
I'm right. just thinking about my right. perspective. What could I do differently? And if I yeah. merely just ask a question and for them to just snap out of it just for one mm-hmm. second and change their mindset mm-hmm. for them to start deregulating or de-escalating their emotion. Right. And for them to rethink and pause, say, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. And yeah. if someone's reaching out to me, do I want to talk? Can I, and, and they, we're during pandemic, I'm just really unfortunate. People are so cooped up. Emotion is so heightened to a whole different level. What if someone just reach out their hand and say, I want to get to know you. And I see you as a human person. I see that you're in pain. What can we do to talk about it? And what can I do to support you? Right. So clearly you have such a uh, compassionate heart for, for your fellow human. How have you taken that and incorporated that piece of you into the work that you do with Bay Rep? Because I, I, you know, I, I, I love your philosophy. So, you know, explain, explain how you've connected the dots um, so that you are showing up as all of who you are in what you do. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, well, everything I do, I do think about that. That this is guide, our guiding principle. What can I? What can we do to elevate someone's life? Mm-hmm. And for us specifically, what can we do to help building the home for them so they can enjoy that life? Right. And even specifically, our application we develop, we have the matching component, not just focus on compatibility of skills and so forth, but also personality compatibility. Is make sure that they are actually well engaged. And then even the communication platform, we, make, we want to make sure that people have a chance to acknowledge how they may sound by recognize the tonality and also sentiment by using this uh, natural language processing, artificial intelligence to begin to understand what this means. And funny enough, a lot of time human or us as you know, human, we are more comfortable taking an app telling us how we feel than is actually conversing with another person because we're probably more fear of someone judging us versus having a system or software to tell us that sounds pretty negative. Would you like to change that? Or would you like to think about this? <laughs> yeah. um, or even to all understand, correct, right? <laughs> right. All correct. Just say, Hey, I understand you have every right to have that feeling, mm-hmm. but think, just hold on a second. How do you think those words are, will be impacting others? And how do you think you're, I mean, how do you think what was going on with your head? And what is it that you can start working through your emotions to be able to say, all right, let me put some perspective. My goal is this, and I sound like this. What do I need to do? Rework this so I can still achieve my goals, but yet not compromise my emotion and still feeling like I'm, I can still have that emotion but be respectful and be professional. Yeah. And just even simple thing as they recognize it. Hey, a lot of time people work really hard. They forget to eat lunch and then they come up with hangry behavior. <laughs> the words will come out spilling out much more stern than they normally would if they had a healthy lunch yeah. or dinner. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so those are little things that we think if we can just nudge people along the way and not to push them, <laughs> just mm-hmm. let them know, just become aware. And a day's yeah. period about awareness. If you're aware of your behavior, if you're aware of this, how this will impact others, the social awareness, if you're aware that you need to regulate emotions, that's how we de-escalate all that emotion into something that's more civil with each other. Absolutely. As we wrap up, um, tell me what your hopes are for the future, for you, your company, and for our society. I'll start with the society. To me, I, what Dr. Martin Luther King did for us, this country, is phenomenal. And his dream is all of our dream. We need to learn to practice in the level that we individual can contribute at home, work, among our friends, and become more color brave to talk about these race, racial issues to talk about things that people are not comfortable talking about it, normalize those conversation. And that's when we can begin to look at tactical actions that we can do to make a difference, to incrementally improving to the right path. 
versus continue to have this add to he say, she say, point finger at each other. It's like, stop pointing finger. Let's grab coffee or do something just so we begin to listen to each other and hearing what they have to say and internalize it to figure out how can we do to contribute and improve their lives as well as our lives. And so that's at the society level. And as a company level, we want to continue to support people to experience the path of building their home, their dream home into reality. Oftentimes as they struggle along the way, making bad decisions and end up delaying projects or spending a lot more money than they anticipated. What if you have a better way to engage at that process and actually enjoy the journey of home construction or home renovation? I know right. it sounds like oxymoron, but, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible. We've seen that over and over again. When people are able to do so, they feel empowered to have that experience on their, you know, just to know that they can do it. Yeah. That's a phenomenal feeling. Accomplish something pretty grand and be able to yeah. own it and yeah. stand in our own truth. That's and I what love I we're too excited that, about. I love too that that you also have a philanthropic arm of your company. You you work with Habitat for Humanity. Am I right about that? Yes. Habitat for okay. Humanity. And yeah. also we serve for um our out here in Los Angeles, we have a, unfortunately um homeless communities that are displaced and yeah. because of housing crisis. And we it's do our everywhere. best. To, it's it's ev everywhere. It's all, we have a huge homeless problem here in Houston as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so we really want to find, we, we do our part of contributing by means of finding a way to even serve them. Even during pandemic, we're fundraising to get you know, sanitizing packs of good, uh, good uh, uh, mm -hmm. like hand sanitizer and other things, supplies to get to their hand. So they don't right. end up suffering so much. And just overall, as a community, we all need to come together, not seeing other different class that we're better than they are, but it's more of they're another human being. What can we do to do our parts to contribute? Even simple things that every season we go through before the season change, our family will get together and look at all the things that we have and go out to different encampments and to provide them, uh, whether it's blankets, jackets, socks, anything we can offer so they can manage through those um, bad weathers. And those are the little things that we all could do, that every, every family could do, so. Simply looking out for your, for your fellow human. It's That's that it. simple. It's that simple. It is really that simple. It really is. Grace, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you today and to hear your story. And um, I, I know there's so many wonderful takeaways for those who are watching and listening. And um, you're such an inspiration. And I'm, I'm just, you know, just honored to know you and really appreciate you sharing your story with our audience. Thank you so much for having me have this experience to speak with you. I'll and I, I think we all share the same mission and I'm here to support you. And I think the more we, everyone, the more of us understand the situation, the better off we are. The more conversations we have, more action we can perform at the individual level, the louder our voice will be. So Absolutely. thank you so much. Thank you. And I look forward to working with you together. We will make a difference. How about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. You have my commitment. Okay. Thank all you. All right. Back at you. Let's do it. <laughs> thank you, Grace. What a beautiful spirit she is. I so enjoyed that conversation with Grace Mace. If you are at all interested in learning more about her company, Bay Rep, we of course will link to it in the show notes on the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to give Grace permission to speak and for having the courage to listen. If you like what we're doing here on Our Voices Matter, you know the drill. Subscribe, download, and share. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.